Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we're going to be talking all about plumerias. They're also very well known as frangy pangy, among a whole bunch of other names, depending on what part of the world you are. In this video lesson, we're going to talk about the plumeria care, as well as repotting them, feeding them, and also creating cuttings using the plumerias. This lesson is dedicated to my friend, Big John's plumerias that you can find on Instagram. And he has many varieties of plumerias that he's propagating by way of cutting. And by cutting, you're creating genetically identical plumerias to the parent um, known varieties that are named varieties, as well as he's also seeding a lot of varieties and creating um, new varieties of plumerias that otherwise would never be found. And he visited me last a few weeks ago at the Anawalt Lumber Spring Gardening event in just off of Pico in Los Angeles, California. And I really appreciate you stopping by to say hello. And so take a moment after this video to follow Big John's Plumerias and also you can write him to find out what sizes and varieties he has available and will be made available for sale very soon. So stay tuned with that. So before we get started on this Plumeria lesson, let me just share with you the Ivory Organics family of products, which include if you come in a little closer, you can see we're gonna be, we're most excited and interested about sharing with you the six macros plus fertilizers. This one here is the premium blend with extra calcium. Here's the NPK MGSCA. You can see that there's numbers all across as this product has all of the macro and micronutrients. You can see the numbers below all of that with 2% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 4% potassium, 1% magnesium, 2% sulfur, 17% calcium. So for your more calcium loving plants, this will be the ideal product. And then over here, check this one out, the Super Blend. This is our, um, our highest blend fertilizer. A lot of time, energy, and effort went into this. 13% nitrogen, 12% phosphorus, 13% potassium, 1% magnesium, 3% sulfur, 3% calcium. And again, both the products contain beneficial microbes and mycorrhiza. Um, gives your plants all of the macronutrients they need, plus many of the micronutrients. Um, and just take a look at how exhaustive this description is in regards to derived from. Feather meal, alfalfa meal, fishbone meal, kelp meal, cottonseed meal, potassium sulfate, glacial rock dust, neem, neem cake, rock phosphate, oyster shell flour, um, and it just goes on and on and on. There's, there's gonna be other lessons where we're gonna get more into the fertilizers and we're gonna talk about the benefits of each of the added parts that are within it to ultimately create the most complete organic fertilizer. It even has crushed rock in it, analogous to um, using azomite, for example. Um, the ingredients also include humic acid, which is a derivative of composting, which helps the plant with the uptake of the elements. And, and again, it just has a very complete Again, all of the macronutrients, all of the nutrients plants need more of, hence the name macro, and it has a lot of the micronutrients as well. Let me share with you some of the micronutrients you can find here on the back of the bag as well. You can see here that it also includes iron and manganese and zinc and copper and boron. And the value of that is you can also use the product in addition to, as these are all dry granular form, you can take a tablespoon of that out to a gallon of water and create a gallon of feed that you can use as a foliar spray or also as a nutritional spray to give your plants a lot of those elements where they can just uptake it through its leaves. One of the smaller bags, which is 11.8 ounces, can make up to 20 gallons of, of liquid fertilizer, and the larger four pound bag can make over 120 gallons. Again, one tablespoon to a gallon. And lastly, the product can also be used as a supplement to your compost tea, and we might be discussing that shortly um, towards the end. And then this here is the Ivory Organics whitewash line. If you come in a little closer, you can see here, this is the first of the Ivory Organics family with a three-in-one plant guard, registered material for use in organic agriculture, protection against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, colors white and brown and green. And then there's also a blue label product, which is specifically known as whitewash. It doesn't have the added oils, which I'm gonna share with you real quick. The yellow line has these added oils of castor and cinnamon and clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary and spearmint, whereas the blue product doesn't have the oils. Instead, it has a garlic and cinnamon powder, but it's really marketed not so much as a insect and rodent repellent, but specific for protection against summer sunburn and winter sun scald. So if your goal is not necessarily pest protection, then you're gonna to wanna to go with the blue line. The yellow line, again, is, is offering protection against the extremes of the sun, 
in the summer, winter sun scald, and then also the added protection of as a repellent against insects and rodents as well. We're gonna be using all of these products in this video and let's get started right now. So before I pull the plumerias down, I just want you to see how I've got them positioned here in the garden. You can see that they've already started to push out some growth and there are also some tips that are blooming. And if you can come in a little closer, I want you to also see what's going on within the containers. You can see that there's um, a fig seedling that has taken root here and a second one that's taken root on that side. And then over here, I have a lantana that I had as a little starter that was in this plastic cup that I'm sure has rooted through the cup. And you can see that there's some clovers near the bottom. And back here, there's some weeds. We're gonna talk about all that starting right now. So let's get started. So it's recommended to repot your plants. And this doesn't just apply to plumerias, but in general, your potted plants should be repotted on average every three to five years. These plants have been in the container for an average of about three to four and I know they can definitely benefit from being repotted now. It's something I wish I did earlier as the best time to repot your plants is also after winter and before spring. More specifically, the best time to repot your plants is after the last chance to frost is past your area, but before the plants begin to push that new spring growth. And that's a different window depending on where you are in the country. For us here in Los Angeles, that window when that last chance to frost has passed is typically that last week of January. So starting the first week of February, mid-February, would be a great time to begin repotting your plants before they push out that spring growth. It's important to repot your plants every three to five years to give your plants a fresh start. What I mean by fresh start is what happens to a plant that's contained for three to five consecutive years is the roots become bound to the pot and the roots will begin to coil and to some degree begin to displace the soil that's otherwise retaining the moisture. So it becomes increasingly difficult to regulate the moisture and the watering within that container. So it is important to basically pull the plant out of the pot, loosen the roots, add some more soil medium. In this example, we're gonna repot the plant back into the same container. The plant has grown only a small amount relative to the size of the container and I know it can continue a longer life within the same container before we graduate it to another container. And when graduating the container also, it's important if you're gonna consider going to a larger pot size, it's important to take just one step. Find a container where it's only gonna add about another inch or a couple more inches of soil around that root zone so the roots can quickly get into that added soil and not leave that soil unconnected to roots so that that soil in that pot doesn't end up rotting and that's the risk when you take a plant from a small container to a like overly large container is you're going to end up with a large volume of soil that's not connected to roots and when that gets wet and again not connected to life it's more prone to rotting so um, so that's your that's another tip when it comes to potting in regards to refreshing it also so we talked about the displacement of the soil by the roots and we talked about the roots also coiling within the pots. The other important consideration is that the plant will become stressed when it becomes root or pot bound. And that stress again is due to the fact that there's less soil and less minerals within the um, pot, again, because it's all been displaced by root. So the other helpful tip is to not repot your plants unless necessary every year or uh, some people repot their plants two to three times a year. The idea being, if it's a young plant and it's growing quickly for its container size, you may need to repot it more frequently. But keep in mind, every time you repot the plant is an added stress to the plant. An added stress that will compromise the amount of growth that will push that year. An added stress that will compromise the amount of blooms that will produce that year. And if it's a fruiting plant, it will compromise the amount of fruit that it can otherwise support as well. So these are all considerations when repotting your plant, like don't be too motivated to repot annually, as again, the risk is it's an added stress that will compromise the quality and the health that will otherwise produce for that year. But again, if you wait too long beyond, again, that fourth and fifth year, it may also now begin to take away from the vigor of the fruit and the flower that you otherwise hope to enjoy. Another helpful key tip is to make sure you don't have any plants growing in the root zone of the plant. If you come in a little closer, you'll notice here We've got these fig seedlings that have 
manage to find their way into the container. There's two of them. There's even a strawberry seedling, um, and I've got plenty of strawberries. I know this is gonna, um, some of you are not gonna like to see that I've just uprooted that. And here's another one over here, another strawberry. So we're gonna pull that out as well. And this here with the figs, we're gonna pull out as well. I'm gonna try to position my hands over the roots of the plumeria and try to pull. And here comes the fig root. And now we're gonna to try to get the larger one out as well. Here it goes. And we got most of the roots. That should hopefully prevent it from regrowing and re-sprouting. When it comes to figs, your fig seedlings are not true to the parent plant. The chance that a fig seedling is going to create a quality fig is very, very small. I would say less than one in a hundred that it's gonna create a quality fruit. So um, all of the figs that we have in our gardens are typically taken by cuttings and propagated that way so they're genetically identical to a quality fig. Um, this here could have been used as the root stock that I could have grafted a quality flavor fig on. But again, I'm telling you, I've got dozens of trees and I've given plenty away. I don't need more seedlings and there's always more seedlings in the garden. So um, we're not going to be doing this. My lesson and my tip to you again with this, if you take a look now around the root zone. So lesson and tip with this is we're gonna enrich the soil and we're gonna add some fertilizer. We wanna make sure that there's no competition with surrounding plants that can otherwise compete and take the nutrients in the soil away from the ideal plant that we have here in the container being we've got this plumeria. We want all of the energy, attention, and love to go to that. If you decide to have any colors around the container or within the container, I'm gonna teach you how we can do that as a little bonus towards the end. So I'll share with you how you can actually have more stuff without the roots competing with one another all in the same container. Um, so we'll do that as well. Just stay tuned for that towards the end. So now we're at soils. And you'll notice over here, I've got these two bags of blue soil. And if you take a look at it, the first one over here I've got that I picked up from the Laguna Hills Nursery, which is at the um, border between Santa Ana and Tustin, you'll notice that I've got Gary's Best Acidic Mix. So this is for your acidic loving plants, such as azaleas and citrus. And on the other side, I've got, and this is what we're gonna be using today, is Gary's Best Top Pot, the ultimate container formula. When it comes to selecting a potting soil, and this applies to your potted plants and pretty soon even your in-ground plantings we're going to be demonstrating um, within the upcoming weeks is you got to be careful to not use a mix that is going to cause the soil to collapse. Almost 90% of the soil mixes I've seen on these store shelves are focused predominantly on forest mulch, leaf mulch, chicken manures and other manures um, and just a whole bunch of, I want to call them, um, organic matter being or com compostable matter is even a better word. The preferred material that should be used in your potted mixes and even for your in-ground mixes is to focus on a potting mix or even again for your in-ground you wouldn't be using potting. For your in-ground um, soil mixes you should be looking for something that focuses more so on a mineral base product. They're gonna be a lot heavier. Generally, they're a lot heavier, but that's gonna keep the entire root system from collapsing. We're gonna be talking about that a lot in upcoming videos, so be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already so you don't miss that opportunity to learn about that. But let's turn that bag around so you can see what I'm talking about here. If you take a look at the back of the bag here, you can see what the ingredients are. The ingredients start with peat moss, and peat moss will break down over years so this here is, we'll call it compostable, meaning that it'll break down. Pumice will not break down. Perlite will not break down. Sand and charcoal will not break down. So all of these ingredients over here, following peat moss, will basically maintain its integrity and shape much longer than most potting soils I've ever used. And that's the reason we're gonna be using Gary's Best um, Soils for this demonstration. Another important lesson if you want to come in, if you, if you take a look here in the pot, is 
when I potted this plant, and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced this as well, it was a lot higher in the container, high enough that when I watered within the container, it had enough to basically allow the water to pool and soak into the soil and I may follow with another watering. But the entire soil level has since fallen and again, as the soil begins to fall, you can imagine that these roots are once elongated as the soil material breaks down and breaks down through the process of, 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 of composting, then the roots will begin to collapse upon one another. So the goal with using a more mineral-based soil mix is gonna benefit the plants a lot in the long run. So I just shared with you the soils that we're gonna use, and, and now let's get started. So finally, let's get the plant out of the container and see what's going on within that root zone. So here we go. We're just gonna carefully pick it up from the trunk. We're just gonna tap around the sides. Try to hit all the corners. And here it comes. And if we can examine the root zone, let's see what we see from, from the sides. Hoping you can take a look here in the light. You can see that it's pretty full. Not quite as root bound as it otherwise could be. It would benefit from having some of this pulled back so that it can rest in a fresh layer of soil like another inch or two. So what we can do is get our fingers in there and let it know you're no longer trapped within this container. And this here will help it grow in the right direction, which is further down and out. We can rub our fingers along the side and just continue turning it around and repeating the process like so. And the fourth side. And over here you can see that the roots are really starting to spiral around one another. So I just pulled these out. I was gonna use some scissors to try to prune it and here I could actually benefit from using some scissors. Um, so I'm actually gonna get my hands on some. So I'm basically going with my pruners here and I can simply prune some of these extra roots that would otherwise be coiled if I put them back into the container. And this is a very light haircut. I was expecting to cut more off the bottom, but we're gonna revisit that in just a second. Let's turn it around some more. And again, this here is a little bit of a larger root. And again, we can just prune that back like so. And around. We'll look at the bottom again. Get on the other side and down. And let's examine again. So again, we're gonna wake up all of these lowest roots. And this is typically where it's the most root bound and where most of the roots will end up coiling upon one another. Again, this seems to be in relatively good condition. If there's a lot of spiraling and coiling happening down here, again, like I just did, you can go with your pruners and prune some of that excess root back. While the plant is resting and out of its container, I'm taking a wet towel. I'm gonna protect the root zone like so. It's important to also put the entire plant into a shaded area um, during this entire process, but we're gonna be done with this in just the next minute or two, so I'm just gonna keep on going forward. So in preparing your container for planting, the next thing to do is to check out the drainage, and it's important to make sure you have enough drain holes to make sure that the water doesn't end up drowning the root system, and the plants can drown just as people can otherwise drown if they're underwater. You wanna make sure that those roots get wet but are never underwater drowning. And in even regards to being wet, we're gonna talk about watering and I'll address that right now. When watering your plumeria plants, you wanna make sure that you soak them, meaning the entire root mass within there on all the soil in between gets completely soaked and doesn't get watered again until it's dry but never bone dry. So again, in the summer, that can mean two waterings a week. Spring and fall, when it's cooler, maybe once a week. And again, depending on the temperature, the climate, and where it's located, these plumerias are located on my north wall where they're in the shade for about two hours even when the sun is up and it's also back in the shade about two hours before sunset. So these plants get a lot less sun intense than if it were on right behind you being on the south side of the garden will get sun right from sunrise all the way through sunset. Those plants in that position may need and require a lot more water. So here we are now. The bottom of the container 
I've noticed it only has one drain hole. This is not sufficient, nor is it ideal. So what we're gonna do is take our power drill and add, and this is a really small hole, we can come in here and add a much larger hole like so. I'm not too concerned about the fact that it may have cracked a little bit along the container, but we've added this one. I'm even gonna add a second drain hole out in this position as well. So here we go again. I'll be a little more gentle. There it goes. That didn't crack at all. So what we're gonna do next is turn this over, and now we're gonna add our rocks. And over here I've got some um, pieces off of other clay pots that we've had in the garden that have um, broke over the years. I always save these and we can just step on them like so to make more pieces. And you can use these to basically block. And the goal is not to block the holes from water, but to block the holes from that potting soil from escaping. So we're gonna add that mixture and get this plastic out of there. Some of the trash wound up in there. And here are some other rocks and gems that also came from once upon a time there was a fish living in here. We can also use these as well. Let me get this larger piece out and turn that around. Like so. Now what we're gonna do is add the potting mix. And check this out. You can see the pumice that's in there. It's pretty sandy as well. Not like a lot of potting soils that are out there. Again, I would put this product in the top 10% of most potting soils that exist on the market. And there, we've just raised the soil level about an inch and a half to two inches. So that's gonna give the plant more room to now grow in. We're now gonna take the plant out and pot it like so. And now we can come with some more soil and basically feed and basically fill in all on the edges. We're gonna go with our fingers as well and make sure that the roots are not exposed to air, but instead are con is in contact with the potting mix. When you repot it, make sure if you take a look, we're right back at the same level. You can see right here are the surface roots. The top foot of the soil, whether it's in a pot or in the ground, are your most important roots. These roots are responsible for um, grabbing the air as well as the elements and the nutrients necessary to support the plant's health. You wanna make sure that those remain covered but only by maybe a quarter inch of soil. You wanna keep the soil level very close to where it was in the original container. If you picked it up from the nursery, you may need to pull some of that soil back because some of the growers just backfill a lot of the soil to make it look like a full container of plant and soil because they think you're gonna buy the plant more likely if it was full of soil, but you really gotta examine to see where are those roots. And if you come in again a little closer, you can see right here near the surface are those feeder roots, right, up, right here where my fingertip is. And then if you take a look along the sides, you can actually see these are the primary roots coming off of the tree trunk as well. This is right where the plant wants to rest within the container. We can just cover it at most with about a quarter inch of soil, knowing that some of it is going to give as we continue watering it over the upcoming week and month. So it's recommended that after about a week, after you transplant your plants, to then feed the plant and not do all of these steps all simultaneous, as everything you do for the plant is potentially an added stress to the plant. Whether you're transplanting or pruning or feeding, these are all stresses to the plant that you don't know how the plant's gonna react to. The other thing too I wanna to share with you before we also feed the plant, you've also seen me prune quite a few roots down below. Um, most of them were small, but had I done any significant pruning, it would be advisable to make sure that you also similarly prune from some of the branches above. So you balance the amount of pruned roots to the amount of pruned branches to create a balanced plant again. If I notice that there's any stress to the plant today, I may end up having to remove one of these branches or maybe even cut the branch in half and allow that to recreate some more leaves and flowers. Because um, each of these leaves and clusters of flowers that are each of these tips are consuming or basically drawing from the water and the nutrients within the container. The fact that I pruned some of those roots could potentially lead to stress to the overall plant. So if I notice that there's some stress going on, to balance it out again, I'm just gonna have to take back on one or two of the branches to balance out what I've done below the ground. 
What we're gonna do next is feed it. And again, like I said, it's recommended to wait about a week from the time that you've repotted the plant or if you're planting in ground, similarly, you would wait about a week before doing the feeding. But again, for the educational purpose, we're gonna just do all the steps at once. So here I am with my, um, I'm gonna be using the Ivory Organics. Six macros plus, the reason being, it's got all six macronutrients, all the nutrients necessary for growth and flower and root strength and um, also heat resistance and winter freeze resistance. All of these elements all serve different functions and benefits to the plant. If greening is an issue, that's gonna be obviously some emphasis on nitrogen. Magnesium is also responsible for greening. Sulfur, sulfur is also responsible for greening. And calcium is the third most important macro element that plants need for creating the cell walls. We're gonna go into a detail with all of those in future videos, but all I'm doing here is taking about a, tea, a tablespoon of the product and I'm gonna scatter it over the surface of the soil. I'm gonna go with a second tablespoon. And again, depending on the size of the plant, you would apply more or less. And again, when you start, it's important to start off with less. It's of more value to do less fertilizer more frequently than doing too much fertilizer at once. And using this granular feed is gonna feed the plant on average for about 60 to 90 days. We're just gonna work that now into the surface of the soil, the top quarter inch, like so. If you wanna come in a little closer, you can see where the fertilizer is, and we're just gonna work that into the soil. And then once we start watering, the fertilizer is gonna begin working. And again, you only need to feed the surface of the soil as when you water, that's gonna grab the soil and pull it down into the root zone of the plant. So many lessons, so many tips. A couple more to go. So when it comes to feeding your plants, summertime is the most important time of the year. If you take a look at this chart over here that I prepared for you, I wrote WI for winter, SP for spring, SU for summer, FA for fall, and then we're back to winter. When it comes to the plant's metabolism, it's really slow. For your dormant plants, there's very little to nothing happening in the winter. But spring, the plants wake up. By summer, it's peaking. Fall, going back down towards winter when it's going back into hibernation and dormancy. Even your plants that are not dormant are still relatively resting in the winter. Even my citrus that may be covered with fruits, it's still the dormant time of the year. It's growing the least. The activity is the least. Even though it looks like there's a lot happening, it is, again, the slowest time of the year, thereby needing less fertilizer, less food. However, as you approach summer when things are peaking, and the plants are exposed to 14 hours of daylight. Per it's spending all of its time making sugars and proteins and vitamins and all of the things that plants do. And again, it's gonna be utilizing as many resources as possible. You gotta make sure the soil has everything that, that it needs. The six macros plus against delivers all of those six macronutrients that plants need, plus a lot of micronutrients, plus a lot of the beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizal fungus. So that's the six macros fertilizers. Well, let's continue on to the next step. Take a look at all of those leaves that are now in the sun. Today is about 80 degrees, approaching 85. Tomorrow will definitely be 85, approaching the high 80s. And these leaves are exposed to too much sun. Take a look at the underlying trunk, the entire tree trunk from all the way down here where, where it's in the soil, all the way up to almost the highest part of the branches are all exposed to too much light. If this was a healthy, better canopy, and again, it could be accomplished by pruning it back and encouraging more growth near the center, but ideally, the plumeria should have a nice umbrella-shaped structure. An umbrella-shaped umbrella structure will shade the underlying tree trunk and branches. But in this case, the, branch, the leaves haven't quite grown out enough, and a couple more branches towards the middle will help accomplish that. But until that is accomplished, which may take another year, maybe two, we're going to need to paint the tree trunk. It's a phenomenon known as whitewashing. So during the summer, these plants are exposed to 14 hours of daylight. That exposure should be predominantly on the leaves and not on the tree trunk and the, and the lower branches that are gonna be supporting this tree for the many years, decades, and beyond that it's going to basically support this continuous creation of more leaves and more blooms for us to enjoy year after year. To protect the underlying tree trunk and branches, it's important to also whitewash them. There's so many reasons to, you know, starting immediately from the time of planting for benefiting your plants through the process of whitewash. 
and we're gonna do that second but first what we're gonna do is simply take this ready-to-use spray if we take a look here, this is the Ivory Organics Ready to Use Spray, protection against damaging sunburned insects and rodents for use on your fruit and roses, fruit, nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. What I'm gonna do is simply take the product and spray it on all the leaves. And this is gonna help the plant, one, as an anti-transparent to help minimize the loss of water, which is ultimately gonna help the plant in the process of this transplant as well to basically um, avoid the risk of transplant shock. And if you take a look, you'll notice some of these, this white light organic film that's now on the leaves, not noticeable from more than a couple of feet away, but up close, hopefully you can capture that in the video. And this here is gonna help keep the plant a lot cooler and help protect those plant tissues from burning. In the meantime, what I'm gonna do, and you may notice from about this point down, and hopefully maybe you come in a little closer, you may notice that I've whitewashed it with the Ivory Organics color white, which is this product over here. And we use the you know protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents color white. And you can see the whiteness that's on the tree trunk going all the way down. It's been over a year since I've last applied it. Today I'm gonna open, I'm gonna open the can of brown. So here this one's gonna be color brown. And we have the option to use this as a three-in-one, the protection against the insects, rodents. Um, protection. We don't really have a rodent issue with rodents biting and chewing on the bark to access the saps again as it's positioned up on the edge of a wall and again I just haven't noticed that as being an issue but the protection against insects is real. If you come in a little closer you may notice that where there are once branches in between this is all exposed wood. Entryways for beetles and termites to otherwise get into it. There's some cracks along the side of the plant as well, if you can hopefully capture that, maybe by walking around the base of the tree. It's more evident along this side over here. You can see all of these cracks that are in the tree trunk. And this here is all potential entryways for pests to get into, otherwise the heart of the tree, the supporting wood of the tree. But what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go with the Ivory Organics. It's gonna basically fill in a lot of these cracks, keep it all pest free, while basically clothing it in an organic way to prevent the risk of sunburn. You would not do this, as most of the research says, using a chemical paint. A chemical paint is used for your house, whether it's indoor or outdoor, it's designed to last for decades. The bark, as you can see, I last applied the Ivory Organics on here about a year ago. The bark is expanding and the paint is ultimately gonna work and find its way back into your soil. If it's paint, you're gonna end up with paint in your soil for decades. If you do things organically, you know that you're dealing with something that is gonna be safer for your soil and safer for your soil biology. So let's get started with adding the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 color brown so we end up with something that's a little bit more natural looking if that's your goal. And there's also color green as well and there's some videos demonstrating that as well. But today we're gonna be doing color brown. So now we're gonna mix the um, the three in one plant guard color brown together. And again, if we take a look at the lid, protects newly installed plants and trees, shield, prune and damage surfaces. So the goal with this one is um, sealing any damaged surfaces that we saw you know, against the trunk, any former pruned branches as well um, that still haven't healed over or entryways because that's wood that's not protected by bark yet. It hasn't grown over yet. We're gonna protect it with this product. And when you open it, you're going to notice this here is your organic base powder. If you take a look at the base, it consists of iron oxide, limestone, mica, milk, and silica. And again, the active ingredients, castor oil, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint oils. And the oils are right here within this bubble, bubble wrap package. And what we're going to do is simply add the powder to the can, like so. And then we can add some water halfway and begin to mix it. Once most of the powder and the water have come into contact, we can then add the oils. And then we'll continue mixing all of that together. Depending on how much water you add to this, you can make either uh, up to five gallons of foliar spray. Ideally, I would be using color white for the foliar spray. You can also use um, two ounces of water to this pint size to create a tree paste. Or you can also 
just fill up the can with water all the way to the top and you'll have a whole can of brush on solution. Once you've added water to the contents, you can begin to brush the product on and offer the lower branches and tree trunk protection from the elements. Again, by protecting the plant, it's now going to end up putting more of its resources, ideally, to more its growth, more flowers, and again, if this was a fruit tree, towards fruiting, rather than putting its energy and resources towards repairing cell damage due to sunburn damage um, or pests trying to bore in and, and, and compromise the integrity of the plant. If you want to come in around, we can actually begin to um, protect the plant together. I'm going to start right here towards the center where again I can see historically there were a couple of branches in here. I know I've used these branches in the past for creating some more plumerias within the garden um, but let's start by um, coating that in. I want you to see where that wood is exposed. This is again barkless wood. A perfect entryway for beetles and termites that could otherwise work their way in and we're simply going to seal that like so. And now we can work our way up the tree trunk. And again, any holes that you see, you're going to want to fill those in with the product. Again, to keep the pest from potentially entering. And then you're going to want to work your way pretty much as, as low as you can towards the soil level. You can see, I'm hoping if you come around, this here I just noticed is a grafted variety of plumeria. This here is the rootstock of the um, rootstock plumeria, and then the top is the selected scion wood that controls the color. The graft is also an important junction that needs to be protected as well. It's pretty much healed over now, but a younger plumeria or any other grafted trees you have within your property, this would be an important junction to protect as well and being more careful to make sure you've got the product all around and into that graft wound to again keep it pest and disease free. And you can see with all of these cracks and crevices, we're gonna have to be a little more careful and apply a little bit more product to keep that all sealed. Well, I'm not gonna finish the rest of this on my own time and we'll conclude in just a few moments. So here we are now, we just protected the entire plumeria using the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 color brown. Take a look at how natural the tree trunk and branches look. And when we coated it, again, we went as low as we can towards the soil level to protect the trunk. And then we went up all the way to just where the new leaves are coming out. And we basically protected that entire area. So the entire plant structure, and especially the heart of the plant, which is where the primary branches and the tree trunk is, the, the, the heart of the plant, to me, is the most important part of the plant to protect just in the event that one of the branches ends up burnt and requires to be pruned or ends up dying on its own, that it doesn't affect the overall health of the plant, meaning, again, the heart of the plant, the lower branches could, can recreate another branch as long as those are protected. So at a minimum, protect the lower branches and the tree trunk and again whatever happens on the extremes can happen and at least you can ensure that your plant will have the longest and healthiest most productive life possible so that was our lesson on the ivory organics whitewash again being the whitewash formula as well as the three in one the whitewash being the oil free the three in one having the seven natural garden oils and we opted for the one with the seven oils again for the added protection against serving as an insect repellent as well the one of the bonus things i want to share with you first is basically what to do if you can actually create cuttings off of your extra branches. If, for example, we notice the plant begin to stress, and what I'm gonna do and continue doing throughout the day is watering the plant. So I'm gonna add a little bit more water to make sure that the entire root zone is wet. The goal with today is to make sure that we soak the plant, and then in a couple more days, maybe two to three days, we'll water it again. But after a week or two, after it's adjusted to its new life, and again, the same old container, but it's in a new planting zone. But once it's acclimated, being about another two to three weeks, we can then resort to the normal watering practice of about two waterings during the summer, again in this container, and then in spring and summer when it's less light and hopefully cooler temperatures, then we can um, also continue watering at a, about a rate of once a week. 
In the winter, it might be once or twice a month. So that's just generally the watering practice that we need. The general rule is to make sure the container is dry but never bone dry between watering. So that's kind of the test um, that you're looking for, engaging your watering practice based upon that rule. The bonus thing we're gonna do is quickly plant a cutting off the plumeria into a container, which I have over here. And we're gonna do that together real quick right now uh, using the Ivory Organics method. Check this out. So if you have a cutting, and this here is a cutting that was taken from a plumeria about two to three weeks ago. I had it in some water, but it's recommended to keep it out of water for about a day or two to make sure that the end of the cutting hardens, basically. It basically pulls back. Um, what we're gonna do, and you can take a look here on the tips, you can see that there's some growth. It's really ready to start growing, even though there's no indication of roots down here on the bottom. What we're gonna do is, again, start with a one gallon container to create this new plumeria cutting. I'm going with the remainder of the rocks that I was able to find here on my property. We're gonna put that at the bottom of the container like so. And then we're gonna go with the Gary's Best Top Pot and fill in the bottom half of the container like so. And you can see I went, well, I went up about a third of the way up. What I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna use a rooting powder. This one here is, um, called, is made by Schultz. But again, it doesn't matter what kind of rooting powder you use. There's other people that successfully use cinnamon powder and honey. The idea behind even any rooting powder, including this, is that it has antibacterial and anti-rotting properties. That's one of the main reasons most cuttings fail is due to rot. So um, a cutting powder will help prevent rot on the end so that hopefully it encourages rooting. And so again, cinnamon powder and honey are predominantly successful that, for that reason. Whatever powder you got on there, try to shake off as much as you can. It doesn't take much to accomplish um, the rooting. And we're just gonna stick that here in the soil. And then we're gonna begin to fill around it, like so. We're gonna work our way to about as high as we can go, but leaving a little bit of a rim for watering. I'm not pressing that hard. I'm just trying to secure it in place. It's important not to compress the soil, and then we can water the plant like so. And what we're gonna do next, because some of you use the Ivory Organics whitewash products on the stems, and you'd ask me, you know, how much of it do I coat? And the answer is, whatever part of the plant is exposed. And in this situation, it's now quite obvious. Now that I've got it planted, the goal is to basically protect it from sunburn as the entire structure is exposed to 14 hours of sun with zero protection because it has no leaves. So what we're gonna do now is take our brush. So now what we're gonna do is simply take our brush and we're gonna coat all of the exposed surfaces. So again, the plant can work more so on growing rather than just trying to survive the spring, summer, and fall temperatures and any exposure to potential burn that it has to continue repairing. And instead it can again focus on growth and rooting. And again, we're just gonna leave those tips alone and basically protect everything, and then basically coat everything else. And we're working our way all the way down to the soil level. For smaller plants, you may wanna just go with the ready to use spray again. And again, the cans can be diluted to also creating a ready to use spray. If you take a look at the back of it, we can do this together. The functions of it here is as a brush on, you're gonna fill up the can with water. For a foliar spray, it says you can use one to two teaspoons, but the breakdown truly comes down to about one pint per gallon. And then as a tree paste, you're gonna add a quarter cup or two ounces of water to the, um, to the contents, and it'll create about a third or a fourth of a can of tree paste product to really prepare damaged bark, um, grafting wounds, um, and however you'd use a tree paste on your property. So in about a week, you can begin to start feeding this plant to make sure that it has all of the macro and micronutrients and a lot of beneficial bacteria, as well as mycorrhiza within the soil to again maximize on the health and the, and the quality of this plant's um, getting established and even performing and growing throughout its entire life. So what we're gonna do with that is, again, we can use either the Six Macros Plus, we're using the Super Blend, which has this red heart on here, which has higher NPK MGSCA, um, or you can use the premium blend, 
which has lower numbers, but added calcium. Um, I've already opened this bag. And again, this bag has the greatest amount. Take a look at the um, ingredients on this one. It has a lot more ingredients, a lot more beneficial bacteria, a lot more beneficial mycorrhizal fungus compared to the premium blend fertilizers, which again, we're gonna do some more lessons in the upcoming weeks explaining the two. But if you take a look at the ingredients, you can see it's derived from, it's only on two lines compared to about five or six or seven lines with the super blend. But here you can see the feather meal, bird guano, on and on and on and on. And then it also has 1% of the six macros plus super blend because the super blend has so much good in it. We wanted to make sure that even the premium blend had some of this in it as well. But what you can do now is you can take just one level tablespoon to a gallon of water. This here is filled about halfway, so this is one gallon mark. Two gallons would be near the top, and you can just put that in there. If your goal is to use it as a foliar spray, you can see here that the contents are floating right there. We can then go with our mixing stick and mix the contents down. It's recommended to do this about an hour before you're gonna apply it to make sure that it's thoroughly mixed into the contents. And then you can simply go with your watering can. Again, if you're gonna use and try to um, use it as a foliar spray. It's recommended to even filter the entire contents to make sure there's nothing blocking the spray end. Um, through the watering can, you can actually still, using the watering can, I'm not gonna water this right now as the, as the three-in-one plant guard is still drying, but I can demonstrate on these vincas that are a little stressed that we're gonna plant next. I can show you that the um, as a foliar feed, you can just water the leaves like that. If um, you want, you can also remove the end of your watering can and water your plants like so. And again, I would do this on top of other soil within the garden to make sure any contents that spills over and around ends up hopefully benefiting another plant. But anyways, the last thing I wanna do is let's work on these vincas real quick. I told you at the beginning, we're going to add some color spots around the plant. Let's say, you know, we're gonna have these beautiful plumerias. We wanna add some colors around it, but we don't want the roots of the surrounding ground cover to compete with our prized plumeria. And we're gonna do that right now using these vincas. And you can see that these two are a little stressed. Again, they're in these compressed little chambers. Um, and it's time for them to upgrade their container size. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put them into this container. And then we're gonna position the container right here on the edge of the container. So we're gonna have some color splash over within the container. The vinca will be in its own container zone. Some of the roots may leak out, but again, we're not gonna be dealing with direct primary roots on top of primary roots right in the root zone of the plumeria. But rather, we're gonna have it competing in the upcoming probably three to four months, and we can immediately resolve this competition by simply removing the container and repositioning it in a different spot around the top of the plumeria um, topsoil. So what we're gonna do now is we're simply going to take the top pot, we're gonna add some soil here to the bottom. And now we're gonna add our vinca color. And add some more soil. Add a little more. And then we can go with our watering can now and add a little more water. And again, this here has the Ivory Organic 6 Macros all-purpose fertilizer in there. The added benefit is, again, one tablespoon to a gallon. A four-pound bag can make 120 gallons of feed, of liquid feed for your plants as well knowing that they're gonna get all of the macronutrients that your plants need. If you compare the six macros fertilizer to any other product on the garden shelf, I bet you, and actually I haven't seen it yet, that you're gonna find a product that has all six macronutrients in it. Ivory Organic Six Macros Plus is one of the most complete organic fertilizers you'll find on your garden shelf. And um, so I just wanted to share that with you. And now let's position that within the container over here like so. And now this entire plant structure will go back up on the wall to my right. And then we're gonna end up working at my own time on the second plumeria. But let's see how this is gonna look when we put it up. And 
here we go. I want to give special thanks to YouTube channel The Wisconsin Vegetable Garden with Joey and Halle Baird. They also have a radio show where the Ivory Organics is the call-in hotline sponsor that takes place every Saturday morning starting at 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Be sure to check that out. I'm going to put the links down below in the comment and a link at the end of this video. Also, I want to give special thanks and recognition to is Dave Stone of Develop Awesome Skills. He's also published a really great Ivory Organics demonstration video showing how the products can be used within his garden. Um, additionally, Diana with Garden Love and, and Tori with Tease TLC Trees. Check them all out. And if you have a if you have a success story with the Ivory Organics products, be sure to share that with us as well at info at ivyorganics.com. Again, if you've enjoyed this educational moment brought to you by Ivory Organics, be sure to give us a thumbs up. Most importantly, subscribe down below to be connected to this and all of our other gardening videos. And also don't forget to hit that push bell notification every time we release a new video with a new lesson that you can hopefully implement within your garden to make this your best growing season ever. Thanks again for watching and happy gardening.